I believe that romanticism is the single greatest enemy we face for love, and that if we are to learn how to love better in the future, we must give up a lot of the feelings that got us into the sort of relationships that romanticism uh, uh, um, uh, points us towards. Almost all of us are addicts, not injecting heroin as such, but addicts in the sense, we need to redefine what addiction is. I like to define addiction not in terms of the substance you're taking. In other words, you know, I'm a heroin addict, I'm a cocaine addict. No. Addiction is basically any pattern of behavior whereby you cannot stand to be with yourself and certain of the more uncomfortable thoughts and, more importantly, emotions that come from being on your own. And so, therefore, you can be addicted to almost anything so long as it keeps you away from yourself, as long as it keeps you away from tricky self-knowledge. And most of us are addicts. And thanks to all sorts of uh, technologies and uh, uh, distractions, etc., we can have a good life where we will almost certainly be guaranteed not to spend any time with ourselves, um, except maybe for certain kind of airlines that, that still don't have the gadgets to distract us. But otherwise, you can be guaranteed you don't have to talk to yourself. And this is a disaster for your capacity to have a relationship with another person, because until you know yourself, you can't properly relate uh, to an, an, an another person. One of the first things that's um, uh, troublesome is that unlike what romantic tells us, um, we are not pure, kind, loving beings simply on the lookout for a soulmate. We are deeply dangerous, and most of us are on the edge of insanity. This is not an exception. It's just what it means to be human. All of us are only just holding it together. We are dangerous to be around. We have all sorts of impulses, feelings, desires, which make us great trouble to be around. The only people we can think of as normal are people we've just met. Once we've met them a little bit more, we will soon realize that they are not normal. Now, something quite bad happens when we start to go out into the adult world and start to choose love partners. We think we're out to find partners who will make us happy, but we're not. We're out to find partners who will feel familiar. And that may be a very different thing, because familiarity may be bound up with particular kinds of torture. And this explains why sometimes um, people will say to us, look, there's a wonderful person, you should go and date them, they're, 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 they're good looking, they're charming, they're all sorts of things. And we go out with them and we date them. And we do recognize that they're really wonderful and amazing. But we have to confess to our partners, that, to, to our friends, that actually we found this person, often we struggle with the vocabulary. We say, maybe not that exciting, or maybe not sexy, or a bit boring. But really what we mean is that we've detected in this really quite accomplished person someone who will not be able to make us suffer in the way that we need to suffer in order to feel that love is real. And that's why we reject them. So we are not merely on a quest to be happy. We are on a quest to suffer in ways that feel familiar. And this radically undermines our capacity to find a, a good partner. So the other thing that romanticism tells us is, um, is if you really love someone and they really love you, you shouldn't use too many words. You will feel an intuitive understanding with someone. And you know, the, the miraculous moments in love are often about those where the other partner seems to understand you without having said anything. This is a disaster. Because this can only, it's a very charming in the first three months. But long term, the idea that someone is going to understand you without you needing to speak or communicate is a disaster. It's a collective disaster that has marred love for millions of people. It's led to an outbreak of sulking. Because what is a sulk in love? love, other than a deep conviction that your lover should understand something, uh, and they haven't understood, and that's why you're not going to tell them why you're upset. You're upset, but you're not going to tell them, and the reason you're not going to tell them because if they loved you, they would know why you were upset. So that's why you're going to bolt yourself in the bathroom, and you won't say what's wrong, because a true lover knows what they would be able to read through the bathroom door what was uh, wrong with you. One of the reasons why love is so tricky for us is that it requires us to do something we really don't want to do, which is to approach another human being and say, I need you. I wouldn't really survive without you. I am vulnerable before you. And there's a very strong impulse in all of us to be strong and to be well defended and not to reveal our vulnerability to another person. Psycho psychologists talk of two patterns of response that tend to crop up in people whenever there's a danger of needing to be extremely vulnerable, dangerously vulnerable, and exposed to another person. The first response 
is to get what, what um, uh, psychologists call anxiously attached. This is attachment theory some of you may know. So when you are anxiously attached to somebody, rather than saying, I need you, I depend on you, you start to get very procedural. You say, mm, you're 10 minutes late, or I think the bin bags need to be taken out, or you start to get strict when actually what you want to do is to ask a very poignant question, do you still care about me? The first thing we need to understand is, let's stop treating our partners as if they were adults, and let's start treating them like small children. The reason why this is so important is, when a small child does something wrong, let's imagine you've got a small child, you cook them dinner, they're two years old, three years old, you give them some broccoli and some schnitzel, etc. you put, them, put a plate down in front of them, and they just swipe it off and go, Aah! and start screaming. Now, what do you do as a modern parent? You don't hit them. You don't go, I'm so offended, I have a hard day at work, and now this, what are you, you're persecuting me. You don't say that, you go, oh, maybe that, my poor child's got a sore tooth, or maybe he's a bit jealous of his sister being born. Maybe that's kind of weighing on him. Maybe he's a little bit tired. That's why he's behaving like this. In other words, we're incredibly generous about our system of interpretation. Um, we don't do this as adults because we think, well, the person's an adult. And of course, most adults look like adults, unfortunately. <laughs> it would be so much more useful if we look like children. Um, because, you know, the, the great thing about breaking something, you've got a broken arm, right? Everyone can see, oh, you've got a broken arm. Oh, I'm so sorry, you've got a broken arm. Let me open the door, you've got a broken arm. If you've got a broken soul, a broken bit of your psyche, everyone thinks you're normal. But you want to go, no, no, I've got this thing that's broken. It doesn't look broken. So we don't look like children, but we are inside. And it's so, you know, we're so aware of how patronizing it is to be treated as younger than we in fact are, that we've neglected in a way how generous, how kind, how truly loving it is to treat someone as if they were younger than they are. Because this is really what it means to love, which is to be generous in the interpretation of the behavior of another person. So ladies and gentlemen, a quick rundown of the kinds of uh, reason, the kind of checklist that you should be making to know that you are ready for love. You know you're ready for love when you have gently understood that of course you are crazy. You have gently understood that, of course, your partner is crazy. You've gently understood that you don't really understand yourself, they don't understand themselves, and your communication is likely to be completely dire at the instinctive level, and you need to bring it on to a more therapeutic level. You need to understand that love is going to uh, uh, be accompanied by a lot of practical details. You won't be on holiday, you won't be with the waterfalls all the time, or the lovely, beautiful clouds, that love is a practical uh, venture, and that you will be unhappy a great deal of the time. Pessimism, pessimism is often seen as the enemy of good things, and indeed it is in many ventures. But when you embark on the journey of love, pessimism, in fact, is the most generous and kindly emotion that you could direct towards yourself and your partner. That is the future of love that I've been sketching for you.